Welcome to this course which has been designed to help the viewer understand the role of semiconductors in electronic devices and specifically their use in very large scale integrated circuits. This course will introduce you to semiconductor physics, optoelectronic components such as LEDs and lasers, and field effect devices and their application to integrated circuits. I encourage you to subscribe to the channel to help make sure that you can quickly find any of the more than 80 mini lectures that you will find here. So we'll do first things first today. Semiconductors are materials with unique electrical properties and this course will show you what those properties are along with why the materials have these properties. So it all begins with the materials. Let's start with looking at semiconducting materials. And that begins with a look at the periodic table. So this is the top right corner of the periodic table, roughly going from groups 1B to 8A. The elements in green are the ones that are frequently involved in semiconductivity. It's not that the other ones are never involved. They might be there as dopants, for example, boron. Elements that are in groups 4 and 6 are semiconductors by themselves, such as carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. Oxygen should probably be in a green box too because it's involved in quite a few compound semiconductors. You notice carbon, silicon, and germanium have a different shade of green because they're so commonly encountered as semiconducting materials, especially silicon and, and germanium. But I will list out all the elements here that can be semiconducting, and sulfur only in certain coordination, and tin only in the diamond crystal structure. There are compounds that you can form from both the 3, 5 columns and the 2, 6 columns. So 3, 5 semiconducting materials include here's gallium arsenide and gallium phosphide and aluminum antimonide. There are two six compound semiconductors such as zinc sulfide, zinc and sulfur, and zinc and tellurium, and so on. And then there are emerging materials such as indium copper oxide and copper indium gallium selenide, which goes by the colorful nickname SIGs. These are useful in photovoltaic applications. You certainly, I don't think, will see them in integrated circuit applications. The workhorses for semiconducting materials in circuits are silicon well that is the workhorse but you will also find gallium arsenide and germanium in some applications less so in, in integrated circuits and more so in discrete components if we want to modify the properties of the elemental semiconductors or the compound semiconductors we can do so by doping them doping means adding impurity elements that change the carrier concentration for example a group 5 compound such as phosphorus is added to silicon. You will add an electron because a phosphorus atom has one more electron than silicon. And so in order for a phosphorus to go into the matrix, the crystal structure of the silicon, and behave chemically like a silicon atom, it has to lose an electron. So it does, and that electron becomes available for conductivity. Likewise, if you dope silicon with boron, you take away an electron because boron has one less electron than silicon. Boron will absorb or accept an electron. What that does is that leaves some silicon atom without an electron. That's referred to as a hole, and those holes get passed around from silicon atoms to silicon atom. They serve as charge carriers, even though what they are are the absence of a charge carrier. The compound semiconductors can be doped as well, Gallium arsenide, the most commonly used compound semiconductor, can be doped, say, for example, with zinc from group 2. And that's going to add a hole because zinc has fewer electrons than either gallium or arsenic. And so it's going to accept an electron from a gallium atom and consequently leave a hole in the matrix. Otherwise, you could dope gallium arsenide with silicon. Silicon is group 4. The silicon will either add one hole, that is, it will either replace an arsenic in the crystal lattice, or it will replace a gallium and add one electron. It can do it either way, depending on which one it substitutes. This process called amphoteric doping 
And which element, gallium or arsenic, that is replaced with the silicon can be controlled with the anneal temperature as the silicon is diffusing into the material. That's three of them. Now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about alloy semiconductors. Combining these three five materials along with aluminum, we can make an alloy where the aluminum and the gallium have to go together and complement each other's composition. So let me explain the X here. X tells you how much of aluminum or gallium there is. You have to balance out one with the other. And so if X is one, you have all aluminum and no gallium. If X equals zero, you have all gallium and no aluminum. So let me show you a little phase diagram of the gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide alloying system. On the vertical axis, you have band gap. Band gap is coming up next. You have X as the variable on the horizontal axis. So when X equals zero, you have your pure gallium arsenide. And when it's one, you have aluminum arsenide. What we have a graph of is the band gap versus X. So at pure gallium arsenide, you have a band gap of 1.9 electron volts. And at pure aluminum arsenide, you have a band gap of 3.0 electron volts. Band gap is the most important characteristic figure of merit for semiconductors. And for most useful materials, it can be found to be between 1 and maybe 4 electron volts. Now, this is not doping. This is alloying. That aluminum isn't just substituting gallium or arsenide in small perturbative quantities. Doping often involves one part in 10 million substitutions for impurities. These aren't impurities. This is an actual alloy. Controlling the band gap with the alloy ratio is called band gap engineering. It will be the subject of our next lecture. Alloying is used as a method of controlling the band gap. Doping doesn't affect band gap, and that's an important thing to remember. The band gap of a semiconductor does not change as you dope it. You simply change the carrier concentration as you dope it. Alloying controls the band gap. We'll spend some time over this semester talking about band gap engineering and the consequences of it what's been done by people with the ability to vary the band gap, how that's being employed, especially in optoelectronics and laser technology. Uh, but for now, at least you, I've gotten you familiar with the notion that you can do this sort of thing, and we'll see some applications coming up.